Sirens busy driving. Guess I'll make my move. Crazy feet on Ladies and gentlemen, art incorporates talent, vision, rationale thinking, and a lot of soul and feeling. Our next guest has this in spades. New Orleans artist, Sasha Masakowski. Yeah, I have roasted dandelion root tea yeah, that right. I really like. Okay. Yeah, right now I'm drinking um, green tea with uh, toasted brown rice. Wow. Which I really like the flavor. Because like, you, you've, you've uh, toured, you've been to Japan, right? Mm-hmm. And so you yeah. would, did you pick up a lot of that sort of cuisine stuff from Japan or? No, I mean, unfortunately, every time I've been to Japan, it's been just like a few days and uh, I haven't spent enough time there. But I mean, I love Japanese food. I probably had more exposure to Japanese food and culture living in New York and having yeah, right. some Japanese friends. And there's just so many great restaurants and tea shops and stuff like that. But um, yeah. So when you go to Japan, is that specifically for art projects or is it been for holidays or? No, it's always tour. Tour. Okay. Yeah. So how often, how, how many times have you been there? I've been, I've only been twice. To okay. Japan. Yeah. And that was on, was that on route to Australia that you, before you came to Melbourne or? It, it was after I was in Melbourne and what was it the summer, right? Uh, you came in late July, so winter. You came in early yeah. winter. Yeah. Yeah, it was July, and we were supposed to line up Japan like right before or after, and it didn't work out. So I we ended up going in October, like a, on a separate trip. So, oh right. Yeah, so you went back. A, to, so you went back to the states, and then went back to Japan. Yeah, that was like that was. I was just going through my phone to try to take some photos off of my phone onto my hard drive and man that was such a crazy year of travel 2018 and 19 mm. i mean just from australia i went to europe a few times went to argentina for almost two weeks for wow. a tour that was incredible did you eat and a lot of china did you eat a lot of meat in argentina i did yeah i, I did i did and i'm not really i don't eat a ton of meat I mean, I, I'm not a vegetarian, but I I don't generally, I'm not a huge yeah. like carnivore, I'm yeah. more of a grains and, and yeah. veggies type of person. But, but yeah, they, um, it was Is funny it- because I, they took me to, on my last night there, the promoter, who's a super sweetheart, he, he took me to like the fanciest steakhouse in, in Buenos Aires and, and like, you know, ordered this giant steak for me. And I felt so bad because, I mean, I, I was so full. Like, I couldn't eat more, <laughs> like, more than, like, I couldn't even get through half of it. I was like, I'm stuffed. Like, I'm, my body's just not used to eating, like, huge amounts of meat. And uh, yeah, They're like the Flintstones there, aren't they? You know, where they just put yeah. a big thing of meat on your plate. And, uh, yes. I mean, the, yeah. the, one of the guys I work with at Birds is from Argentina, and he, yeah, you probably remember him. He was a video guy. Yeah, um, and and he's he just talks up Argentinian food, and I'm and I'm just like, dude, I get it. And he's invited me over, and I've had tasted the barbecue. Uh, yeah. But I just, I'm like you, I can't. I get a bit sort of sick by looking at it. I know that's yeah. weird because in, because I, I was saying in another podcast because I do a lot, I, I do a lot of yoga. Yeah. And over the last seven years my consciousness, I don't know what it is, morally has diminished the need for high levels of meat yeah. purely because of the cruelty to animals. And, you know, I know we need to eat meat for protein and all that sort of thing. And I'm not trying to mm-hmm. sort of advocate not eating meat, but yeah. just for me personally, um, that's what I've found. Uh, it's more of a mm-hmm. conscious thing. It's, it's weird, isn't it, how mm-hmm. the more you get into your body, the more you sort of realize other things. It's yes. sort of which is, um, totally. you know, which is something you've probably had to do in the last seven. Uh, do you mind me asking about your situation? No, yeah. no not at all. I was, I was just going to say that sounds like, I, I think, I think I've grown so much over the past <laughs> seven weeks or eight weeks, uh, spiritually and mm. just, um, kind of 
you know, just becoming more in tune with my body, with, um, with thought patterns, you know, um, yeah, (laughs) it's been a really, it's been a ride, you know, it's, uh, it's very interesting. I mean, you know, I, I had a, so my, my roommate, do you remember my bass player? Yes. From, yes. He's a lovely uh, Max. guy. Yeah. Max. Yeah. yeah. So this is Max's house. I'm in his right. room. You can see all the bases. Oh yes. But yeah. Max is married to my childhood best friend. She's yes. like my sister and I live with them. They have this beautiful house. It's their family home. It's, mm-hmm. it's like a 120 year old gorgeous house. And, and it's kind of in the countryside, a little bit North of, of New Orleans proper. And, um, to stay here, live here for a few months and then and pack up my car in June or July and move to California. Like I, I kind of want to live in Los Angeles. So, uh, but anyway, at the, at the end of March, kind of right when everything started happening and the, the talk of coronavirus was in the air and the city, the government was starting to shut down, you know, restaurants and music venues and stuff. Max came home and was just sick. I mean, he had what we thought was like a flu, you know, and, it, and, but it was still too early. And both his wife and I were like, you don't have coronavirus. Like you're, you're yeah. probably just have a cold, whatever it's fine. And, you know, and he had fever and body aches a few days. And then, and then the first day that they opened up testing, because at that point you couldn't get a COVID test. Mm. And on the first day where they opened testing up to the general public, he said, I want to go get a test. I just want to know. And uh, by that point, I was already feeling like just kind of funky, like something was off. Anyway, he went to get a test. He waited in line for like six hours or something Man. awful to get a nose swab. Five days later, they called back and said, yeah, you have coronavirus. And by that point, I was already in the throes of it. I mean, it was just kind of, and it wasn't even, that's what's crazy. It wasn't even so bad. It was just this fear, like the fear of the unknown, the fear that was going, you know, like it's like collective consciousness. Everyone in the world is Mm. so scared of this virus. And at that point, it was still so new. No one really knew anything about it. Like the statistics were just all over the place. You know, people are saying, oh, yeah, people in their 20s and 30s are dying from this thing. You know, like it was just so I I think. what I learned from it was, was really, first of all, how important it was. And I'm glad that I attacked it right away uh, with, you know, tons of vitamins, zinc and vitamin C and lots of, and drink so much water and so much tea. And, um, and then also just like sort of tapped into like at certain points, I just had to, I had to get off of the internet for a couple of days at a time, stop reading the news, stop talking yeah. to friends who were paranoid and, yeah. and like, you know, you might have to go to the hospital and this and that, you know, and just, and just, um, but did you have of, any breathing problems or? Um, yeah. I, I mean, it, it, it never got like so bad that I felt like I had to go to the hospital, but for sure I, I couldn't sleep. I wasn't sleeping well at night because my, my chest was, I don't know how to describe it. It felt like literally like tight. Was, elephant sitting yeah, right. on my chest <laughs> and I couldn't get comfortable. Shit. I'm usually a yeah. side sleeper and I couldn't sleep and then I'd be on my back. It mm. was just so strange. Um, yeah, right. and it was like keeping me up, you know, and it, and it lingered. I mean, I, I still, I still feel it like, mm. but it's much more mild. It's like every week that progresses, it gets a little bit better, but it's still there. And I'm on week seven now. So God. it's just like a long lingering thing. And, and, and you haven't been to the GP to get any antibiotics or anything like that? They won't give it to they me. Won't they won't give me anything. Yeah, right. No. Wow. My primary care doctor said, there's nothing we can do. There's yeah, no right. for this. I went maybe two and a half weeks ago, I went to the hospital to get a chest x-ray because I was still having... Mm such severe chest tightness and pain that I thought maybe I have some lingering pneumonia or something, Mm. but my chest x-ray came back normal and they said, yeah, we can't do anything. Just keep taking, just keep drinking water, eating healthy, staying hydrated. I haven't been, um, I haven't been exercising. Like I, I usually do a ton of yoga Mm. and and I, I haven't been doing 
aside from stretching, yeah. no physical activity because, you know, it's like you want to give your lungs a chance to really heal. And if, yeah. I think if you put, if you do aerobic exercise, yeah. it kind of flares up. So, Qigong might be good for that. You know, just small yeah. um, exercises that don't need a lot of power or strain yeah. from your body. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. But um, that sounds pretty full on. Um, mm-hmm. I mean, I don't know what to say about that. I mean, I, I just know uh, politically uh, the government in Australia is um, they're releasing um, restrictions, um, mm-hmm. yeah, which worries me a little bit because mm-hmm. I think if you're going to go back to work, anybody, that's just generally anybody, you have to have a medic they're testing people not just once but mm. every day and the mm. thing is we don't have the resources for that yeah. so so yeah. if, if the governments are going to open up how are they going to cope with that now i just think we're just lambs to the slaughter i really believe it's a um, sort of like a conspiracy to put people out there and just see who falls and who survives you know yeah it's Oh, there's so just many. Just for the economy, you know, wise, you know, just right. just get the economy up and running again because I know that they're yeah. bleeding, you know, but. Um, I know. I don't know. I, I mean, it's it's hard to say. At the same time, like, it's also not, I, I also feel like it's not a death sentence. And I know so many people who have it. So many people in New Orleans, friends of mine, yeah. got it because Mardi Gras happened. Yeah. at the end of February. And it was just, you know, it, it was spreading like crazy. And I have a lot of friends in New York also, you know, I mean, yeah. I haven't, I haven't lost anyone to it personally. You know, I have friends who have lost people, but I, but I think it's also just important that, you know, we, we know that it, that it's not, it's not a death sentence if yeah. you get it either, yeah. you know, and it's and it's almost nothing to be so fearful of. And I I think the con, you know, I think the media's way of mass manipulating people into mm. being so scared is really yeah. dangerous. It is, you know, it and is. So, I mean, it's hard for people. I mean, you know what it's like. I mean, unless you're a um, if you're a self thinker, you're right. I think you know if you can make your own decisions. You know what I mean. Like you you have a good mm-hmm. vision of what you are, who you are. Um, mm-hmm. what's real to you as an individual, then you can sort of cipher some of that stuff. But yeah. as you know, for the most GP, um, you know, it slams to the slaughter really. You know, that's what I think, mm-hmm. you know, yeah. which is a real shame. Now, just I want to just move away from that a little bit. Um, mm-hmm. Did you ever watch that series, Treme? <laughs> Actually, I, I didn't watch the whole thing. I was I was living, I was living in like, Shank, no, Beijing, I think at the time when it was coming out, and I just didn't have access to it. So you actually but lived in China. I lived in China for four months. Right. And uh, it was right around the time when Treme was out. And I, mm. I just remember not having access to it. And, but all my friends were in it. Yeah. <laughs> everyone, everyone I know was in it. Yeah, right. Had songs in it. Um, Great yeah. series. I mean, I, I, yeah. I kept up with it for a little while, and then I just sort of, my favorite. Um, actor in that or the, uh, the character was um the guy with the glasses who was learning how to play music and he was the dj you know in the radio station okay do you know which oh, guy i'm talking about i do um i just liked yeah. his lifestyle i thought his lifestyle really um yeah yeah harmonized with something i wanted to be when i was 20 uh, cool. <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah sure. but, uh no he there was a great series but um yeah, so um, the Mardi Gras, can you tell me a little bit about how that all operates? And Because uh, I know uh, sure. Donald Harrison. Do you know Donald Harrison? Mm-hmm. Yeah, he's sure. like a chief, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, he's a big chief. <laughs> I wish Max was here because he could tell you so much about Because he plays it with Donald Harrison. He plays wow. in his band and he's Donald's like a second father to him. Mm. And uh, actually he came and played at Birds with Donald. Actually, now that Yeah, I he did. He did, yeah. yeah. Um. But yeah, I mean, Mardi Gras is essentially a celebration. Uh, it's geared around Lent, you know. Um, it, it's it's it happened like it's the forty days of of it happens right before forty days of Lent begins, mm-hmm. you know. And then there's Easter. So 
uh, Mardi Gras day is like Fat Tuesday, and then the next day is Ash Wednesday, and then and then Lent begins. Um, so it's tied and, in with the religious stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're right. So same in I same in Brazil, I think. Okay. Also, and, and other places where they celebrate mm-hmm. carnival. And um, yeah, it's it's essentially you know one of our sort of oldest historical. I mean, New Orleans is like. I feel like we our years go by in like seasons to party. Like there's always a reason to celebrate here. It's like a very people down here like just really live life to the fullest. You know, they okay. love like excuses to to dress up and to parade and to eat good food and drink and hear music and so um yeah, so Mardi Gras is is, you know, we call it carnival season. Um it's it's I think the whole thing lasts like a month and a half mm. uh, from beginning up until Mardi Gras Day. And as it gets later and later, closer to Mardi Gras Day, there's just more um, parades that we have and like social gatherings and there's balls and all these ceremonies around mm. it. And, um, you know, the parades have these big, giant, beautiful floats where, you know, people that are masquerading they have masks and full suits on and they they throw trinkets and mardi gras beads to the audience to the people you know in the in the crowd and there's marching bands and have you taken part in that parade i've never been in a parade actually um which is funny i, I was thinking that recently oh, I've never been in a parade. but um no i've just always been on the on the sidelines like because you only can and, I- That'd be great. I mean, because your family is all musicians, so you could yeah. get, get one <laughs> of those dad, double. Yeah. yeah, my dad's been on a on a few um, okay parades. Yeah, like playing music and stuff. Yeah, because yeah. I mean, the double duke bus, you know, and the band playing up the top there, which sounds just looks incredible. You know, that's what <laughs> yeah, you want to be exactly. doing. You know, yeah, <laughs> totally. <laughs> Here's Sasha, you know, I know coming down. So fun one day. I mean, that sounds incredible. Uh, I've never been. You know, I haven't been to America. I've toured. Asia, oh, wow. Europe, yeah, and I just haven't been able to get to the states, oh, which is man. sort of, which is sort of weird, right? Because that's the home of rock and roll and jazz. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You have to come. You have to come. Come here. Come to New Orleans. Mm. New Orleans, New York, like maybe L.A. Mm. California is beautiful. Yeah. Well, California's got the weather right all the time. Yeah. Yeah, all the time. All the time. That's the best. That's what I like to hear. All the time. Good weather all the time. What is it for you guys now? Are you going into winter? Winter, yeah. We're like yeah. three weeks away from winter. Wow. Cool. Dark clouds, rain, wow. thunder, bats, crows. I'm so glad that the all the wildfires have sort of there's a yeah, we've had it's been weird because we had the fires and then we had corona. So I know. It's been full on, man. I mean, I remember in summer, because we didn't really have a summer because it was just so taken up by the fires. Yeah, that was so heartbreaking. Oh, it was incredible. Um, And people are still homeless from that whole experience. Oh, my God. I mean, you can only imagine, right? I mean, if your house has been burnt down and or your your little suburb has been decimated, where are you going to go? What are you going to do? You know, and and with the coronavirus, with all the money, I mean, it's just a disaster. You know, it's something probably not too dissimilar to what you guys would have experienced back in 2005 with um, Mm -hmm. uh, Katrina. Katrina. Um, Because I was saying to you yesterday that uh, I just want to tap on this just briefly. But I remember I was touring. I was in London and um, I woke up and I put on the television and I was exercising and I was looking and it was hard to comprehend Mm-hmm. all these images coming from new orleans you know uh, oh, i remember yeah. one i remember one guy was on top of his house mm-hmm. you know and people were on top of their houses and i just thought i, I didn't know what to think I, I was just like what the mm-hmm. fuck is going on there you know and and then just the whole sort of government thing letting people down and you know the whole thing was just another yeah. weird thing you know but how is how has new orleans recovered because that's been what 15 yeah. years, whatever, yeah. you know? Um, it's, it's, uh, whew, 
it's a different, I don't know. It's so hard to say. I don't think New Orleans is ever going to be the same that mm. it was because to me, what makes New Orleans, New Orleans are the locals, like mm. the people yeah, totally. who live here, who have been here for generations, you know, mm. and, um, and a lot of them like left or lost their house, you know, lost their house and had to leave or were too traumatized to ever want to live back here again. They moved to Houston, they moved to Atlanta, they, they said, I'm done, I can't, I can't yeah, risk right. losing everything again. And um yeah, and 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 in and the place of it, you know, came all these well meaning, lovely like people from New York, from all, you know, from California, from like just from all over the country who came here to try to help rebuild New Orleans and then realized, oh my God, this place is amazing. And the people mm-hmm. are awesome. And it's really cheap here. And I can, I can move here. I can, I can buy a house here, you know, why not come down here? And so right. you have this huge influx of, of people that were rooted here that left and then people that had never been here were, were moving here, but just like flocking here, basically. Like, we want to rebuild the city, we, you know, because they felt drawn to it. This is also like, you know, I will say like, we have the internet now, so I feel like nothing's ever going to be, you know, like there's no kind of best kept secret or whatever. I mean, a lot of people said that about the Treme series, actually, yeah. that, oh, the Treme series kind of like gave away all New Orleans, like, all the best kept secrets about New Orleans. Yeah, right. And then it was on Treme and then these little hole in the wall dive bars were just, you know, all of a sudden all these tourists are coming like, Oh, you know, so the tourists I, weren't, wasn't there before Katrina. Like they weren't no, looking. They, they were, but it was like, sorry, we feel like termites. Um, we have, uh, they were, <laughs> it's termite season in New Orleans right now. And <laughs> this is a 120 year old wooden house. Wow. And I'm like, Oh no, they're coming. They, they're um, uh, you know eat it up i know i know well it's, it's about like 120 it's... years so maybe there's something there <laughs> it's immune to the um termites <laughs> hopefully but there but it's only like it's like two weeks in the whole year that they start swarming and it's it's like happening right now yeah so anyway um <laughs> you're in australia you know like you know about <laughs> <the> critters <laughs> Blocking, yeah. except one just fell in my laptop. Anyway, um, so uh, no, there were definitely tourists here, but um, I, but I feel like New Orleans was kind of like America's best kept secret. Like every, it was like you had to be there to 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 see it. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> <laughs> it's like the plague. <sighs> Go away! It, it's worse with the light on. Sprite garlic, man. Just spray chop up that. garlic and spray garlic. <laughs> Maybe that might do, do the trick. So, well, that's great. And um, yeah. so I've noticed on the internet you've been performing with Nicholas Payton because um, yeah. I tuned into your stream the other day. And, oh. um, yeah, I'm just curious how you came about working with Nicholas because um, he did come yeah. to Birds and I worked with him briefly. Oh. With, um, Thanks. Uh, I can't remember the woman's name. Was it Jane Monite? Jane Monite. Is she from New Orleans? Yeah. No, no, she's not. She, she but I knew York. he was working with her. So. Yeah. yeah, yeah, cool. And uh, yeah, so that's how I knew him. And um, cool. Yeah, and uh, he, and I remember he was playing the trumpet and the Rhodes at the same time. At the same yeah. time. Yeah. So he's a bit of a. He's a bit. An, he's incredible. Yeah. But can you tell me how you came about? Because I mean, yeah, with your internet show that you did the other day i noticed that you were doing a lot of your electronic sort of beats and, yeah um, i'm like soundscapes. not singing yeah. yeah it's cool it's super fun for me because it's like a different i'm using a totally different skill set and and i'm also i'm able to be like a sideman which usually like i i'm the band leader like i have mm. to be the performer and in this case i am i am a support person i'm supporting him mm. he's you know it's like it's super cool. I mean, is, yeah. Is it all I, improvised or is it sort of? Yeah. Yeah. Great. It's all improvised. Yeah. Fantastic. Um, but he, you know, Nick was like, Nick was like a hero of mine mm. for, for years. Like, mm. I mean, I, I totally idolized him and he, um, I guess it was like about two years ago. I had this big show in New York. 
with my electronic project called Trash Magnolia. And I, I really wanted Nick to hear the music I was making. Like mm. I was, I was like, I know, I know he's going to be drawn to this stuff because it's, it, you know, I feel like it's really cool and really innovative and he's such an innovator. And so anyway, I like, I got kind of a little, a little bit tipsy one night and like, I just messaged him on Instagram. I had never spoken to him before, you know, I mean, he knew I existed and you know, whatever, but like, I just never had any interaction with him. I'm sure he had never heard my music or whatever. I messaged him and I was like, Hey man, I got this show in New York. Are you going to be up there for winter jazz fest? I'm playing this big show at Brooklyn bowl. Like I'd love to feature you as a special guest. It's with my electronic band, trash Magnolia. Like, and he got back right away and was like, yeah, sure. Send me the music. I'm down. And I was like, Oh my God. So I sent him all this music and he really loved it. And it was awesome. And, and so he came up and played a few songs and then, and then that was kind of the, it was like the clicking moment, you know, where like after that he started calling me for gigs in New Orleans, we played over a jazz fest. Um, and, and it was that I, I was basically like using my loop station to like sample him essentially. And then also yeah. making beats. Um, and, and, uh, and then we had a show, I had a show booked at this really great club called sidebar in New Orleans on March 5th. And I didn't have a band. I was like, Oh, who am I going to get for this gig? Like it's, it's usually kind of an improvised situation. So I on a whim texted cliff and Nick, and I was like, hey, guys, I have this gig. Like, you know, it's probably not a lot of money, but, like, you don't want to do it. And they both were like, yeah, we're totally down. So we played this show on a little, you know, Thursday night at the beginning of March. It was packed. People fucking loved it. The energy between the three of us was just so strong. It was, like, it was so much fun. And then a week later, you know, quarantine, like, yeah. lockdown. Everyone's got to be locked down. Yeah. Nicholas jokingly was texting us, like, oh, we should make a record and call it quarantined. And I was like, haha, yeah, that's that would be really funny. Mm. We should, you know. And then all of a sudden, he, like, posted the album art on his, wow. on his Instagram page. And I was like, oh, shh, are you serious? Like, we're going to make a record. So mm. we did. We went to his house for, like, three days straight and recorded, you know, a few, like, whatever, five, six hours per day. Mm. And then spent the next three days editing everything and then it was like as soon as we finished editing the city was like quarantine you're yeah. not allowed to see anybody like everyone has to isolate so i mean we we literally finished it just in the nick of time and then since then he's been calling me to do weekly gigs with him where you know i'm playing uh, a drum machine and oh, i think max is home <laughs> max to say hi yeah um yeah. So, uh, yeah. So that's been that's been a really cool. cool that thing sounds to that sounds of. really interesting because I like I said I tuned in I did listen to it uh, all the way through and I actually posted on your Facebook page saying where do I donate yeah. some money to you? Oh yeah. But you didn't reply, so I just. <laughs> 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 so I was happy to give you a couple of bucks, you know. Oh, you're sweet. Thank you. And I mean, I know the Australian conversion won't be much, but uh, you know. <laughs> But, um, but uh, you know, the rhythm of that was, uh, it sort of was hypnotic for me because mm -hmm. I, I could hear, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but I could hear when you he was starting and then you were trying to find your pace with it. But then yeah. as you went along, you sort of found the pace and then you got into it. And then yeah. that's when I thought, wow, this is really interesting because now they're connecting and now they're yeah. taking it to another. And I really yeah. like the way he uses political. Um, yeah debates or commentary over the top of it i think that really totally. um yeah you know gives you another perspective of uh the emotion side of things of the yeah. uh, track so, so, so it's not I rather agree. just so it's not just the trance thing it's not just the uh, yeah. beats thing it's actually got more content to it than that mm -hmm. so that's sort of how it transpired yeah totally yeah yeah it's like i'm i'm basically like coming up with these loops and these and these uh rhythmic ideas Look, Max. Hey, how are you, man? I'm good. good. How are you? Uh, it's good to see you, you, you two together. Look at that. What a picture perfect that is. The New Orleans group and Donald. I wish Donald Harrison could come through that door. I know. <laughs> <laughs> nice. No. Well, that's it. Give him a call. Tell him to come down. Yeah. Yeah. Good to see you, Pete. Yeah, likewise, man. And, um, 
All right. So we what we we were talking about Nicholas Payton, weren't we? Or... Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So it's been really fun. I mean, it's I'm basically live DJing or live producing. Yeah. Um, because you come from a traditional music family, don't you? I mean, it, and that's why I'm interested because you've you've sort of gone more to the electronic side of things in a way. But you also do do the traditional stuff. But mm-hmm. why have you gone down more of that electronic um, path? Is it because um, you, you can be a bit more creative with it, or is it, or you got it's more tactile? Or yeah, I mean, kind of both. I think um, for me, uh, electronics. You know, it, it's like. Hmm, how do I put this? I mean, first of all, I've always loved electronic music. Mm. Like the, I love, you know, whether it's like I'm in whatever a club or at an electronic festival or mm. certain artists that I'm just I've always been really really drawn to, um, and and drawn to sound like sound like the sounds of like the Skype the sound Skype sort of stuff. Yeah, yeah, sort of. You know, like. If, you go to a super bass heavy drum and bass concert okay. or you go to see you know an EDM artist mm. is, um, Max is oh hello Baz what's his name <laughs> this is Baz Baz how are you I wish I, I should bring in my little dog Rudy oh. but I, I think I think he'll be a bit um, he won't be as placid as that <laughs> yeah <laughs> um, but yeah so uh and then I think also the more I was uh, writing music, the more I would, um, I, I always felt like I, I just wanted complete control. Like I wanted yeah. to be able to play all the instruments and I don't play a drum kit. So the next best thing, sorry, was, um, was having like drum machines basically mm. that I could, I could use. Yeah. So I bought, I have these two drum, drum machines that I work with. One is a, an analog sequencer and the other is, uh, electron digitact where mm-hmm. which i love because you can sample your own sounds mm-hmm. so like i'll you know i could go out and and you know crumple up a bunch of leaves and and, and then sample it and then mm-hmm. turn that into a beat or you know and then affect it and eq it and, and yeah. treat it like it's some little that know, sounds way. that sounds that's progressed a lot since i was studying uh, sound art yeah. i used to have to go out and you know, with a mini disc and with a microphone yeah. and record sounds <laughs> and then put it in Pro yeah. Tools and do all the yeah, stuff that you're doing. In yeah. My, yeah, you know. <laughs> I know. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So that's taken all that laborious, laboring uh, processing out of it, I guess. Mm-hmm. So it's just a matter yeah. of, so it's just, you can take this machine, you can, do you need a microphone with it? To, to, to... You do, yeah. I mean, you can you can use like your own microphone, but um, it has like a built-in thing, but it's, it's not very good. But mm-hmm. uh is yeah, that, and then and then you can also like chop it, you know, in in the actual drum machine. I mean, yeah. you can chop it to the length you want it, start yeah. it wherever you want, whatever part of the waveform you want it. You can reverse it. You can okay. You know, so yeah. when you when you're working with Nicholas in that context, yeah, that you just recently did. It, were you taking his trumpet sounds and his mm-hmm. keyboard sounds and then doing that on the fly? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. That's pretty impressive, man. Yeah, it's yeah. it's a lot of um, it's it's like I have to be really uh, hype, and that's also why I don't sing very much. I have to be super vigilant because he's looking at me to like you know. First of all, I'm I'm creating all the the drum sequences and the mm-hmm. patterns. So I'm I'm like kind of the beat. I'm the drummer in a way. Mm-hmm. Like so, I have to come up with something that's cool, that's going to groove really hard, and then and then he's going to come up with a bass line. And he's going to look at me when he's ready. For it's me changed. to loop that, yeah. you yeah. know, and so then yeah. I have to be ready to like, okay, like start yeah. to loop, and then is this going to be a four bar phrase or an eight bar phrase, mm-hmm. and just kind of like intuitively guess where he's yeah, going right. with it, and then uh, and then he'll come and play keys, and then kind of look at me when he's ready for me to loop, yeah, the roads or a synth part or a trumpet part, and then you know, and then and then drop things out, you know, whenever if he's yeah. taking a road solo, like I'll drop the roads out or. Or sometimes I'll, you know, okay, I'm going to do a drop all the drums out. And it's just going to be, you know, bass and whatever, maybe hi-hat or something, you know. And sometimes I'll throw these curveballs at him where, like, I can also transpose, which is really cool. So, like, um, occasionally, like, I'll, I'll just, like, 
he'll be in the middle of taking a trumpet solo over this, you know, loop that he's put down and I'll just like transpose the whole thing up a whole step (laughs) and then he'll look at me kind of like laugh (laughs) and be like, all right. And then he starts soloing the whole step up, you know, and then I'll drop it back down and he, he just like catches it immediately. He's such a genius, you know, but um, are you planning to do obviously more work with, uh, that combination with Cliff included or Cliff hasn't <laughs> Cliff Cliff hasn't been wanting to um, uh, do these concerts because he's quarantining with his like elderly parents mm-hmm. and he's just is doesn't yeah. want to he's baking yeah he's just like doesn't want to leave the house mm. unless he really has totally. to and I think totally. especially with me having it like mm. he's a little nervous about yeah he doesn't want to catch it and then his yeah trans- but that's that, that's the thing isn't it. Um, not yeah. passing it on to elderly people. Yeah, but I, I, I mean, you know, I'm, I think I'm far past the yeah. Yeah. contagion point and I've been hanging with my parents and it's everything. Is oh, well, you'll get that card that you'll be able to travel because you're, you're immune to it. I hope so. Mm. They they just started the antibody testing. So Did they? Like to, yeah, in New Orleans. Wow. So I might try to do that next week and just, you know. Just to prove that I have, I'm sure I have them. I mean, yeah. Just, uh, yeah. But but in a way, yeah, it would be nice to be able to feel like I can travel and mm. not feel scared mm. to, that, oh, I might catch this thing. You know, mm. like, okay, I caught it. I, <laughs> yeah. I'm over it. Well, so nice. you're a pinup person for the government. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Maybe they'll put you on. Maybe they'll take a picture of you and put it in the airports. Survive. You know, this is the picture exactly. of survival. <laughs> no. COVID nineteen <laughs> survival. Survival. Yeah. Right. Vanity Fair. Can you tell me a little bit about that? Because they gave you a huge rap. Um, mm-hmm. Was that last year? You were in that magazine. No, it, it was. It was a few years ago. Okay. Vanity Fair did this big piece on. It was called like Jazz Youth Quake or something like that. It was, it was essentially like um, a nod to all of the sort of young up and coming jazz artists. Mm-hmm. Um, and I was living in New York at the time. And I think a lot of a lot of the people who were listed in this piece were um, New York based musicians. And um, yeah, it was it was it was just a huge honor to be, you know, mentioned in so, so that's, Taste Magazine also did a, a, a thing which was really cool. So that was um, while you were living in New York? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And how long did you stay in New York for? I was in New York about four and a half years. Okay. Yeah. And then and then you moved to LA or you moved to back to New Orleans? Back to New Orleans. Okay. Um, yeah, I moved back to New Orleans last uh, last spring, technically. My lease, my lease was up I think at the end of April. So mm-hmm. I, I moved to New Orleans, back to New Orleans in May. And I, but I was traveling so much. Mm-hmm. I mean, that was, that was like, you know, in April, I think was when I went to, I was going to Argentina and then I was coming back and then I was going to go, I had just been in Shanghai and in Thailand. I knew Australia was coming up and then there was going to be Japan and then back to Thailand. It was, it was just like, it almost didn't make sense to be in New York anymore because I was never there and I was mm. paying so much for rent yeah. and I was just traveling all the time and and trying to find subletters when I would leave town and and things like that and so um yeah so I, I moved back here uh with the hopes that like okay I'll give myself you know six eight months in New Orleans and then mm. head out west but who knows yeah <laughs> who knows well, Shanghai what what did what what's there in Shanghai? Like, can you explain to me what yeah. you do there? Yeah, yeah, Shanghai. I did. Um, I was. I did a. There's a great jazz club in New York called Jazz at Lincoln Center, and Wynton Marcellus started this yeah. club. Yeah. Uh, and um, they opened a venue in Shanghai, Jazz at Lincoln Center, Shanghai, mm-hmm. and I was invited to play for three weeks there. Um, with it actually wasn't my gig. It was this really amazing pianist named John Chin. Uh, John is, lives in New York City, and he had invited me as a special guest with his band. Joe Dyson was also on drums. Oh, so great. That, yeah. So, and that was really cool. I mean, we did uh, six nights, six nights a week for three weeks straight. Wow. At this wow. beautiful club in Shanghai. Yeah. 
It was awesome. And how many people would fit into that jazz club? Was it as big as Bird's Basement or? Uh, it was, it might, it might have been a little bit bigger than Bird's. But, um, you know, the crowds kind of depended. I mean, because mm. it was six nights a week, like, yeah. you know, on a Tuesday or Wednesday, it was pretty light. But by the mm. weekend, it would it would fill up for sure. Yeah. So they're keen, it, they're keen enthusiasts in China for jazz. Well, I don't know if I would say that. The Chinese are, I don't think that they, um, I don't, I don't know if they really like get jazz the way that like people in Japan get it, mm-hmm. you know, in China, it's almost more like, it's, it's like a status symbol. Yeah, right. If, if you're Chinese and you're going to go to a club where, you know, Western people are just yeah. are the entertainment, it's like, mm. it was a lot of people like, you know, taking a lot of selfies with, with us in yeah. the background on their phones. And then throughout the entire concert, they were on their phone. They were scrolling on their phone. Yeah. They'd be at the dinner table with their partner. Part, and they, I yeah. mean, they wouldn't even listen. A lot of times, like people wouldn't even be applauding after songs. Wow. We actually had to have, um, the person who would introduce us every night, uh, he would tell them, um, you know, it's okay to clap yeah. after songs. We wow. actually, that's encouraged here. Wow. It's just such, I mean, that's you know, crazy. China's been through a lot. Yeah. I mean, the cultural revolution was real and didn't end until 1972 or four, you know, and it's mm. like, so I just, you but, know. But even still, I mean, you would think they'd have some music. See, music works on a different level, as you know. It's working more on a auditory level and also on a uh, feeling. And if you're so detached by your internal feelings and, do you know what I mean, if you're sitting through something and you're hearing someone play incredible music and you're there mm-hmm. worried about how much likes I'm getting on Facebook or mm-hmm. whatever it is. We chat. <laughs> we chat yeah. or whatever it is. There's something weird about that to me, you know, because you're just so disconnected, you know, that whole dis- yeah. And for someone to mm-hmm. specify prior to the gig to say, stop doing that and listen to the music and interact mm-hmm. with, it's like mm-hmm. it's like educating the, the people about what it's like to be connected with other people. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. It's sort of, yeah. Yeah. which is strange because I always thought, I went to a Chinese doctor for many years and he did mm-hmm. acupuncture and, um, and I did Tai Chi for a little while and... Mm. And I always thought China was purely just by doing martial arts and mm-hmm. seeing a Chinese doctor. I thought, man, for them to do these poses and these exercises, mm-hmm. they must be on a different trip, man. Like to mm-hmm. because they're so, and what they do to your body, internal body and stuff, it's just incredible. But yeah. so, but then you get on the other hand, they go to a club and they're so disconnected. So go figure. I mean, I don't know what's the um, yeah, that's a strange thing. Yeah, it's strange. It's kind of a bit of like an oxymoron because you're yeah. right. I mean, Chinese culture, I mean, one of the old, the, old, the most yeah. ancient, yeah. you know, and, uh, and then certain traditions, right? Like, like acupuncture, like, um, you know, herbal, a lot yeah. of herbal remedies and yeah. things like that. And, but I don't know. Yeah, I mean, it could be it could be a generational thing. It wasn't, yeah, think, wasn't everybody. I mean, mm. certainly there were plenty of mm. you know Chinese people that loved jazz and, yeah. and were really happy to hear us. But and was that difficult for you to perform to to the crowd or? Yeah, yeah. It, it it was. It was a little. It got it got really. It felt like um it felt like work. You yeah. know. When usually it, it should feel really inspiring after yeah. a show, you feel like, you know, just really uplifted. And, mm. and uh, I mean, thankfully the musicians were awesome. Yeah. But, um, uh, but, but yeah, it, it, it was, it was after three weeks, it was like, whew, okay, like I'm, I'm glad. Is it, that's when you came to birds, right? You came from China to birds? No, or, no? I, I can't. No, after that, that was actually, that was at the end of 2008. That mm-hmm. was yeah. That was November 2018, and so Birds was the following July. Okay. But um, yeah, no, I I went to uh, I actually went to Thailand mm. after that, and that was a really cool trip because I I sort of was like, you know what? After I'm already in Asia, like mm. I've been working for three weeks straight. Like I just want to go 
on a little like vacation, have a little solo mm. time and, and, uh, and go spend like five days in the jungle, like in the North of Thailand, like mm. near Chiang Mai and just, and just kind of like not talk to anyone for five days and maybe write music or just read books and meditate mm. and just chill. And so I, I booked an Airbnb, um, and it was like the listing was was like uh, living in the jungle. You know, it was it's this little tiny village that was on the outskirts of Chiang Mai, and it border the house that I would be staying in bordered the biggest uh, jungle essentially in Thailand, and then behind that is Burma. You know, mm-hmm. it's like it was just jungle, 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 and I was like, this is perfect. And, of course, it's Thailand. So it's dirt cheap. You know, it's, mm. it's super nice place for super cheap. And, and when I um, when I showed up, uh, it, it just it was so funny because it was like this um, synchronicity that I could never have imagined. Um, you know, the it, it was it's two girls that own this Airbnb. They have a restaurant in this in this little village, and and I got in late at night, and they said, "Oh, we're at the restaurant, but our friend's gonna let you in. Um, just text him when you're there." And so I text the guy, "Hey, I just got a cab. You know, I'm showing up." And and I I you know I get I'm greeted by this this older guy, uh, and he he opens the door and he goes, "Hey, Dwalin, let me get you bags." And I was like, "Are you from New Orleans?" And he was like. Yeah, how did you know? And I was like, me too. Like I can hear it in her voice. You know, wow. like a sixty-five-year-old like gay guy who like moved to Thailand twenty years mm. ago, and uh, and then and then it turns out that like the one of the girls who owned the Airbnb, she's like loves all the same music that I love. Like we're listening to all this, all these artists that she knows that I know personally. That and she's just totally hip to like all like friends of mine in New York that are mm. like really underground. And she's like, that's, that's my favorite band. And anyway, and she, she promotes, uh, she does like, uh, she's a graphic designer mm. and a concert promoter. And since that meeting those people, I've gone back to Thailand like three or four times oh, fantastic. to hang with them and they mm. put on shows for me. And it's like, you know, and and is this redesign nor- my website. Is this in the Northern part you do the shows? Yeah. 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 You don't do them in you don't do it in Bangkok or and Bangkok no. also actually okay. Bangkok has a really great jazz scene and yeah, right. uh, and I was able to connect with some really great musicians there and teach teach a few master classes mm-hmm. at like these different conservatories in Bangkok and that okay. was really cool and oh man well, that sounds Thailand. terrific yeah, it's great. yeah Thailand's an interesting place I went there <clears throat> a long time ago and. Uh, I'll just be very brief, but I, I had uh, a dream before I went there. This might sound strange, but, uh, and it was me running down. I was in the countryside and there was all uh, bark chip everywhere. And it was quite a steep hill and very sparse forest. And, uh, and I was rolling, being chased by the Viet Cong in Thailand. Whoa. I know this sounds weird, right? And then anyway, so I went, I went to Thailand six months later after having that dream. And I went to the northern part where you're talking about near Bur- yeah. B- the Burmese border. But that, in that time, I think Burma was in a civil war, so they yeah. you couldn't get through to couldn't Burma. Yeah. And uh, and I stayed in one of those huts that you were talking about, where they own the restaurant and there's there's a um, uh, accommodation with that. Uh-huh. And uh, they took me on a tut tut down around the area, mm-hmm. and uh, and what I had dreamt six months ago, I saw the exact landscape. Wow. It freaked me out, man. I, I was like, stop the tut tut. And I had a look wow. and it was, ex- I swear, swear to God, it was wow. exactly what I had dreamt. It was that bizarre. Is amazing. <laughs> Chills. I it's know, a premonition. Right? I know, amazing. right? But I mean, yeah. the Viet Cong chasing me. So I'm thinking, was I in the yeah. Vietnam War or something, you know, in a previous wow. life, you know? Wow, that's really interesting. Maybe that explains a lot of my hiccups in life. <laughs> do you ever check out, do you ever read Edgar Casey? Oh my gosh. <laughs> So interesting. No, wow. is that is that about that type Edgar of thing? Casey was like a he was like a prophet that lived in I guess the eighteen hundreds. Yeah, right. And he he talks a lot about past life and, and send me uh, the link. Send me his name. Oh yeah, there's a ton of stuff. He's yeah. the reason why we found the Dead Sea Scrolls. He was like yeah, one of those right. mystics that was able to look at somebody and know like 
you know, oh, you have this disease and this, yeah, you should right. probably get this checked out. And where was this person from? Oh, I can't remember. I, 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 it's been, I don't know. I don't want to mess up the details, but I'll, I'll send you some pictures. Yeah, because kind of stuff, talk about people who can um, read people. Um, I go and see this Qigong guy and he's mm-hmm. from China. And I was sitting in his, when I'd go in his waiting room and wait for him, Mm-hmm. I'd look at this guy and it was a massive photo of this Chinese guy. Mm-hmm. And I was, after about four weeks after seeing him four times, I asked him, I said, look, can you, who's that guy up there? And he said, that is my professor in um, China. Mm. And he said, that guy is 90 years of age. I said, wow. he, looks, he looks like he's 50, man. Wow. And he said, this guy could be next, sitting next to you at a bus stop and he could x-ray your whole body and tell you exactly what's deficient in your body. And he said a lot of American professors have gone up to that part because they found out what he could do and they wanted to study him. And then he realized that it wasn't being studied for the good of Qigong. So he disappeared and he said no one can find him. He's gone into the hills and he doesn't want to have anything to do with anything. So he goes, I go, I know where he is, so I go to him and, Wow. And I get my information from him because this guy apparently cured himself from cancer from, from just doing um, Qigong exercises. Yeah. And I yeah. posed that to a previous – I interviewed a mate of mine who's a scientist and he's mm-hmm. totally disregarded that whole <gasps> purpose because he said, where's the data that shows that? How can, oh. That's not – that's just like Darren Brown stuff, you know. But I believe it. I, I sort of believe in that mystic stuff. I don't know about you, but um, – I think there's something to be said about that. Absolutely. Also, mm. I know we were talking earlier about like uh, dealing with spiritual growth, but I mean, I, I've been doing a, a a pretty serious meditation practice for the past six months, I guess. I learned a style called Vedic meditation, which is similar to transcendental meditation. Okay. And um, that's been just transformative yeah, for me. Okay. And especially right now, you know, like the past month or two, and yeah uh, yeah that's so, great I yeah i just do it daily for 20 minutes but i do it off an app yeah. it's called headspace i don't know if you know it at all oh sure i've heard there's yeah, yeah. There's so it's so it's great just to sort of be led by this english guy's voice mm-hmm. and uh but 20 minutes it, it seemed i don't know about you but my meditation i find that because i did zen meditation very briefly many years ago which was mm-hmm. uh, looking at a wall and then you have to go and explain to the Zen master, you know, what's going on, what's going on in your life. So, and he would just look at you and tap you on the head with a stick and say, go and look at the wall again, mm. you know, and that's, mm-hmm. that's it. You know, you, and I'm going, man, but I don't see anything in the wall. I just see <laughs> bad painting. Someone painted that wall, man. It wasn't very good. Pa- <laughs> <did> it. <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> you know, I'm seeing yeah. the defects in the wall, but no, that's all, all jokes aside. But yeah. I sort of, um, uh, that was, uh, I did a, uh, a Zen meditation, uh, you know, intensive. Mm-hmm. Have you ever done one of those before? Uh, I mean, I, I guess when I was learning the style that I, uh, practice now, mm. I was, it was like a four day intensive course, yeah. training course, I guess, you know, and, and essentially it's, it's a, it's like mantra based and, and it's, um, I meditate 20 minutes twice a day. Yeah. Okay. And, um, and basically this is, it's also just, it's like, um, there's not really a goal. I mean, sometimes the, the meditations you're, ju- you're just sitting there with your eyes closed. You don't say it anything yeah. out loud. Okay. You just think, think this mantra. And essentially what happens is it triggers your brain to go into like a, a just still quiet, okay. relaxed place. And it's, uh, you're, you're accessing like really deep levels of rest when you're, doing that and um to the point sometimes where you transcend thought you know and you're just you're just in the this sort of like being state you mm. know and okay. um so it could be similar to what you're saying like just staring at a wall mm. it's like okay well i'm not really yeah thinking you, about anything but in a way if you can get to a thoughtless state, yeah then that's, that's like, right that's really cool it's hard looking at a wall with your eyes open because that's the whole thing about Zen. You, you don't close your eyes. Oh, you, you keep, keep, your, you keep eyes your, open. your eyes open. So that's even harder because you're just, yeah. you know, you, I don't know. It's the most difficult thing I've ever done in my life. You know? Wow, interesting. 
and I didn't get near. But it sort of it sort of was like taking acid without taking acid, mm-hmm. if you know sure. what I mean. <laughs> yeah, sure. So it was sort of. <laughs> <laughs> but um, anyway, really... well, I want to thank you for your time. I appreciate it, yeah. and I wish you all the best with your health and um, and your music. And let's just hope we all get back on ground again and yeah. back to where we were. And bring you to New Orleans as well. Yeah, that'd be awesome, know. man. Yeah. That'd be fantastic. <laughs> Yeah. All right. Well, take care. Thanks, Pete. Okay. Take care. Okay. Bye. It will tear apart your head when voodoo strikes. You wish that you was dead when voodoo strikes. It will tear apart your head when voodoo strikes.